Okay, now we will share the screen and introduce. So I wanna thank, I know most people know Peter and he's given talks here almost every year, I think at least, <laughs> um, and familiar with his wonderful orchids. Um, so Peter is gonna be presenting his newest talk, Compact Mini Vandas, um, Compact Vandacious Species and Hybrids. Um, this was written up, I won't read it all verbatim, but it was also on our website and in the newsletter. Um, and he's gonna run through many pictures along with cultural tips. Um, Peter's been uh, growing for over 30 years um, and um, has been an accredited judge with the AOS, is a hybridizer of mini cats. Um, and you're also editor, right? On uh, <laughs> recently for Orchid Digest, I believe. Uh, I was, I'm past president now. Past president for Orchid Digest, yeah. yeah. That flew by. Well, probably wasn't, didn't fly by for you. It was probably. <laughs> <laughs> so Peter's been very involved in all aspects of orchid life. Um, and he points out that he's got thousands of photos of his orchids that he maintains on a Flickr site, which he's listed here. That's also in the bio that's on the website if you want to look for it. Um, and he specializes in miniature orchids due to limited growing space. Both species and hybrids received numerous AOS awards. Um, uh, his interests are include dendrobiums and gracoids, and as we'll hear tonight, neophoenicias, and um, maintains a collection of a thousand or more orchids at his home in Southern California in small, three small greenhouses, as well as in the house under fluorescent lights. So without further ado, I will stop sharing and turn the floor over to Peter. So uh, your co-host, you should be able to, there you go. Okay, I will start sharing my screen. And looks good. Um, you can go okay. in, perfect. Uh, hopefully everybody can see the title slide, which is Compact Bandacious Species and Hybrids. What we're gonna look at tonight, uh, I'm gonna review some of the species, including Neophoenicias, Ascocentrum, Hocoglossum, Vanda, and others. Uh, we'll look at the hybrids that are mini and compact, and even touch upon micro mini Vanda hybrids. I'll talk about culture, uh, which includes a little repotting session. And at the end, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can have a time for any questions. Uh, as a suggestion, you might want to write the question down as, I, as I'm presenting. That way you won't forget what your question is at the end of the program. Okay, the species. So the premier miniature Vanda species is Neophoenicia facata, and it's been used heavily in the breeding of the uh, mini Vanda hybrids. The type species looks like this. It's pretty much a white flower, uh, very compact plant. The fans are about three to four inches tall and three to four inches wide. Uh, and you can grow them in a three or four inch pot without a problem. So they're very compact. Uh, you can grow them on your windowsill. Um, and then for the lucky ones in California, we can grow them outside they will take temperatures down to freezing um, without a problem. There is an, uh, a form called the Amami Island form, and it is just about 30% larger in the flowers and leaf habit. Uh, so, so it's just a larger form of the Neophoenicia falcata. There are other color forms that exist uh, primarily pink uh, magenta spurs and a pink blush to the flowers. Now, the, this uh, orchid is native to Japan, Korea, and into China. Uh, the Japanese have, uh, have their own society just for Neophoenicians, and they name all of their varieties with a Japanese name. So this particular pink colored uh, Neophoenicia is called Shiteno. Very lovely. 
Uh, these, uh, all the Neo-Phoenicia falcatas are very fragrant at night. They have a nice jasmine, coconut, vanilla smell. This is another variety called Toya Zakura. There is a green form and the primary uh, green variety is called Hisui. So it's kind of a pale green with a white lip. This is a, a selection of the green variety that uh, 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 I had awarded uh, back a few years ago. This is called Green Galaxy. Next, we have yellow. Now, uh, yellow pretty much does not exist in nature. So there is the theory that there are hybrid genes within this yellow form. Uh, but uh, it looks, the flower and the plant very, looks very much like a regular Neophonesia, but uh, it has a little bit of a different fragrance and it tends to bloom twice a year, uh, showing you the hybrid influence. The Japanese give the yellow uh, variety the name Kibana. And this is a very large, darkly colored form. Um, and it has a cultivar name of yellow dragon. Some other color forms. Uh, this is variety Benny Kuroi. Uh, and uh, it is also thought that this probably has hybrid uh, genes in it because uh, it's uh, pretty much a solid lavender pink color. Uh, the bean leaf varieties have a little bit of a different flower shape, uh, and typically they face upwards towards the sky. This one is a common variety, and it's called Tomokongo. And then there are many, many variegated uh, leaved varieties. This one is called Shiruga Fukurin. Okay, uh, this is a slide of, uh, of Neophonesia Pakata in situ in Japan. Uh, this is a ginkgo tree. And if you look at the main branches, they are covered with Neophonesia Pakata. Here's a close up of it. There must be thousands of plants on this tree. All in full bloom, it must be very fragrant. Okay, next we have uh, hocus, um, sorry, ascocentrums and hocoglossums. Uh, just on the technical side, uh, all of the neophonesias and ascocentrums have been moved to Vanda. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, I think it's useful to know the older genus name so that you, you're not confused with uh, the large Vanda types that you see out there. Uh, these, these uh, ascocentrums are very, are very different in their growth habit and their cultural needs. Uh, and the hocoglossums luckily have stayed as a, as a genus. Uh, the first one is ascocentrum gary. So this uh, plant grows, starts blooming when it's only about five inches tall. Uh, and you can see the flowers are small. They're less than an inch across, but there are many flowers on a single spike. And each fan can put out two to three spikes. Next, we have Ascocentrum ampulaceum. Uh, dark pink flowers, although there are other color forms. Uh, this is the orange form. And there's also a white form. Ascocentrum curvifolium, known for its brilliant orange color flowers. These are more on the compact side, not quite as miniature um, as, as Gary. Uh, Ascocentrum arontiacum. 
also has very small flowers. Ascocentrum christiansonianum. This is a slender plant um, and it, each plant will put out multitudes of spikes with lots of flowers. The flowers are about an inch across. Uh, they're kind of a blushed pink color and they have a nice round shape. And we'll see the, this species used in hybridizing. Uh, <clears throat> next we have the hocoglossums. Uh, one of the uh, favorites is hocoglossum flavescens. It is a miniature species. You can see my hand there for reference. The flowers are about an inch across. And typically, almost all of the hocoglossums prefer to be mounted or put in a basket so that the roots are exposed to the air. Uh, once they're covered with media, they tend to rot. So you have to be very careful about watering if you're growing it in a pot. Uh, but uh, if you grow it mounted, you usually uh, will not have any problem. Next, we have Hocoglossum rupestre. Uh, the flowers are very similar to flavescent, but I find that there are more flowers on the spike, and the leaves are longer and uh, terete in shape. Hocoglossum wangii is a compact grower. It's larger than both flavescens and rupestra. Uh, the leaves are fairly long and they tend to be pendulous from the weight of the leaves. Hocoglossum amesianum. This is a fantastic species uh, known for its fragrance. It has a very strong jasmine smell. Uh, the only thing, though, is there appear to be two forms of this species. And I'm not sure if they come from different areas of Asia, uh, but one of the species is not fragrant. Uh, and so uh, when breeding with this, you definitely want to find the fragrant one. And then the tiniest of the hocoglossums is pumilum. The plant is less than two inches tall, two to three inches tall. Flowers are about uh, less than half an inch, maybe a quarter of an inch wide. Okay, so let's take a look at some other mini and compact vandacious species. So within the uh, vandas, we have vanda cristata. And this is known for its really striking lip. Uh, it's white with blood red striations in the lip. And the tip of the lip is like a forked tongue. This particular species is, has very um, dominant, the dominant traits are, are in, the, in the hybrids, as we'll see a little later on. This is typically a cool to intermediate grower. Now this is Vanda longitapala. So many years ago, there was a Vanda cristata that received an FCC award with the AOS. Uh, it got the FCC because the flowers were huge and the lip was uh, even more striking than the, than than the other Cristata plants. Uh, now we know that this, that Cristata was actually this species, which is called Longitapala. You can see a resemblance to Cristata, but the lip is bigger, longer, and more marked. And it's fairly rare in cultivation. Um, and there's just been a handful of hybrids with it. Next, we have renantheras. So uh, most of the renantheras are huge. You know, they can grow six feet tall, eight feet tall. Uh, but there are a couple of dwarf ones. And uh, this one is on the dwarf side. Renanthera citrina will start blooming when it's only about eight inches tall. Uh, the flowers are yellow 
with red spots. The other dwarf species is Monachica, and this has yellow flowers heavily spotted in red. Next, we have Christiansonia vietnamica. From the name, you can tell this is native to Vietnam. And it's a very compact grower, has really beautiful green flowers with a white lip. Probably the tiniest of the Vandacious Alliance is Shinorchus fragrans. The plants typically are less than two inches tall. Flowers are very small, as you can see here. Uh, to date, there have been no hybrids with this. Uh, I know people have tried making a hybrid with it. I'm just not sure it is uh, compatible with other uh, Vandas. Next, we have Sideria japonica. Uh, this is uh, native to Japan, and it has very fragrant flowers. They have a nice uh, citrus, kind of a citrus jasmine smell. And on a well-grown plant, you can see that it can have four to five spikes from a single fan. Okay, so those are the primary species that you might see in the background of the mini and compact hybrids. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the mini hybrids. Uh, as I mentioned before, Neophoenicia has been used quite a bit in the breeding of the mini Vanda hybrids. Uh, this first one is Asca Phoenicia cherry blossom. Uh, it is Neophoenicia cross to Asca centrum ampelaceum. So you get the charm, charm of the Neophoenicia uh, with a nice pink color from the Ascocentrum. This is a clone coming out of Japan with very nicely round flowers called variety Omega. Uh, this is Petite Bouquet. This is Cherry Blossom. Cross back to Ampelaceum. Ascophenicia kaori is cherry blossom crossed back to Neophenicia. Next, we have Ascophenicia peaches. This is Neophoenicia cross to Ascocentrum curvifolium. Ascophenicia twinkle. This is with Ascocentrum garyi. Uh, Ascophenicia AF Buckman. Neophoenicia cross to Ascocentrum christiansonianum. Uh, Neo stylus pinky is one of my favorites. This is Neo Phoenicia cross to Rinco stylus gigantea. This was using the white form of gigantea. And this is using the magenta form of gigantea. These inherit a really lovely fragrance uh, as both parents are very fragrant. And then there are a host of spotted ones uh, using the spotted Gigantia. This is a, a clone of Pinky called Starry Night. Uh, next we have Neostylus Lucneri. This is crossed to Rhynchostylus Calestes. And again, you might see different color forms. Uh, this is the very famous and popular bluebird.
Uh, Fuchs Ocean Spray is Neostylus uh, Lucineri crossed back to Rhynchostylus Calestes. It inherits that lovely blue lip from Calestes. Next, we have Daranara Charm. This is variety Blue Star. And then we have Rainbow Stars. This is Charm crossed back to New Phoenicia Falcata. And uh, I actually registered this hybrid because the breeder is unknown. Uh, and I called it Rainbow Stars because all four of these colors came from the same seed pod. This is yellow pearl. Uh, Ascaphenicia singing starlight, another yellow hybrid. Doranara deep blue seas. This is charm crossed to Ascacentrum Christiansonianum. Most of them were in this kind of violet blue color but a few came out pink as well. Vanda Phoenicia Virgil. This is a Neo Phoenicia cross to Vanda Cristata. And you can see the, the Cristata lip comes through. Darinara Walnut Valley. This is Charm by Virgil. Again, the Cristata lip is dominant. Here's another one. And another one. So these hybrids are about eight, eight to 10 inches tall and about five inches wide. Uh, Nako Motoara Newberry Apricot. This is Virgil crossed to Ascacentrum, uh, Ascacentrum curvivolium. Uh, Vanda Venetia Newberry Lemon Drops. Bill Burke by Virgil. Again, you can see the Cristata lip is dominant. That's in a four inch pot. Uh, Naka Motoara Jean Gadilhi. This is the very famous Ascacenda Yipsum Wa crossed to New Phoenicia Falcata. Ascacenda Rumrill. <clears throat> Curvifolium by Vanda Cristata. There's that Cristata lip again. Uh, next, we have Ascacenda uh, Dragon's Blood. This is one of my hybrids. I crossed Rum Rule by Vanda Langita Paula. Uh, this is Vanda Cristata by Vanda Testacea. Uh, Nakamoto Ara Nafu Ward. This is probably the best out of the cross. Uh, Aska Phoenicia Moonlight Firefly. This is a uh, twinkle cross back to Neo Phoenicia Falcata. And it does bloom two or three times a year. Uh, Ranisha Sunrise, this is a hybrid with Ranathra uh, in Shudiana. Neostylus Dragon's Tongue, this is one of my hybrids. Uh, this is Pinky by Vanda Paula. 
was very pleased with this cross. Uh, I only got one flask back from the lab with about 20 seedlings. Uh, luckily, I've tried, I remade it twice now and hope to have more flasks at the lab. There's already been one FCC and uh, I received an AM on this cross. Uh, Van, Vanderia Newberry Jasmine. This is a hybrid between Sideria japonica and uh, Hophoglossum anzianum. And it truly is one of the most fragrant orchids I've ever smelled. And indeed, it has a nice jasmine smell. Now, interestingly enough, I bought some seedlings of the hybrid from, from Taiwan. And when I bloomed them, they were not fragrant. So evidently, they used the non-fragrant form of, of Hocoglossum of anzianum. Uh, Rinko diarrhea dragon charmy. This is uh, Sideria japonica crossed to Rinko stylus gigantea. This is a hybrid, a new hybrid that I saw in Taiwan at the Taiwan International Show, uh, Rinconopsis shui by Sideria japonica. Uh, Bandopyria little one. This is Sideria japonica crossed to Bandopsis uh, parishii. Really cool yellow flowers with leopard spots. Uh, this is a hybrid of mine, Vandopyrea many sandy. Uh, this is a hybrid between uh, Vandopyrea little one crossed back to Sideria japonica. Interesting enough, three people made the hybrid at the same time. Uh, and the person in Germany bloomed it first, so they named it Mene Sandy. Escanopsis Yicheng Amanda. This is a Ascacentrum cross to uh, Dorit Doritinopsis or Phalaenopsis. Hocostylus Blue Jenny. These are hybrids between uh, Neostylus Lucineri and Hocoglossum Magic Jenny. Hocostylus MS Sunlight, Flavescence crossed to Gigantea. So this really dwarfs the size of Rhynchostylus Gigantea. Flowers are fragrant. This is uh, Horrid de Stylus TLDC Shy Virgin. This was made in Taiwan. Oco Stylus Pink Yawi. This is Pink Jenny by uh, Rinko Stylus Gigantia. Uh, these are some new hybrids coming from Thailand. Hocoglossum rupestra by Ascocentrum curvifolium. Vandoglossum pear blossom, rupestra by Ascocentrum christiansonianum. These are first bloom seedlings. They will be have many more spikes and flowers when mature. Uh, Flavescence by Vanda Cerulescence. It inherits the really lovely grapey fragrance from Cerulescence. Uh, Hocodiria Glen Lair. Hocoglossum Flavescence by Sideria Japonica. Uh, Hocanopsis Yawi's Little Eric. This is Flavescence by Thalanopsis. Philippinensis. 
this is my hybrid. This is Vando Blossom Apple Blossom. This is uh, Aska Phoenicia AF Buckman by uh, Opal Blossom Pink Jenny. And my newest hybrid, I just registered this last week. This is Hoko Van Stylus Ping Pong. There are just three species in this hybrid. First, we have uh, Neo Phoenicia or Vanda uh, Falcata. We have Rinko Stylus Gigantea. And then the Hoko Glossum is Hoko Glossum Fongii. And it's the first hybrid with the newly named Hoko Glossum Fongii. Here's a little family shot of four, four first bloom seedlings. And you can see they are very, very consistent, consistent in the flower spotting and shape. Okay, my last little section is on micro mini vandas. So uh, you saw the, the really micro mini species called Hocoglossum pumulum. Um, this is a hybrid between Pumalum and Wangii. This is Hopoglossum Pink Jenny. That's a two inch pot there. <sighs> uh, Aska Phoenicia Ferus. This is Pumalum by Neo Phoenicia Falcata. Uh, Aska Phoenicia ferus by Aska Centrum Pusillum. Again, a two inch pot. Uh, this is my hybrid. This is Doranara Itty Bitty. This is Charm by uh, Hopoglossum Pumillum. Uh, these are some hybrids that I saw on the internet. Uh, they are very tiny, but have no clue as to what the parents are. And the person posting this would not divulge the parents. Here's another one. Okay, uh, let me talk about culture on the mini bandas. So where to grow? Well, they are nice and small and compact. Uh, so you can grow them on a, on a bright windowsill. Uh, they will also grow under lights, uh, particularly LED lights are the newest thing now. Uh, and then and many of them will grow outside. They're, they can be very temperature tolerant. Uh, a lot of them will take temperatures down into the 30s without a problem. So uh, even if it does get colder than that, you can grow them outside for the majority of the year. Likewise, they are medium light uh, lovers. Uh, they don't need as much light as the true vandas, the, you know, the large growing vandas that you see out of Florida and Hawaii. Um, so they'll grow and bloom with Cattleya light conditions, dendrobium, epidendrums, that sort of thing. Uh, temperature wise, again, a lot of the species in the background of the hybrids are temperature tolerant. Um, so they can take temperatures down into the 30s. Uh, and then on the high side, you know, 90s to 100 is usually not a problem either. Humidity and air circulation, they are not as demanding of humidity uh, as the large flowered vandas hybrids. Um, and you do want to give them some air circulation so that the roots can dry out when the, after being watered. Uh, Water-wise, uh, I grow almost all of my mini vandas in, in plastic pots with bark mix. Um, and so uh, that allows me just to water once a week, sometimes twice a week when it's really hot. Uh, and then in the winter, every 10 days to two weeks is all they need. Uh, so they are not the same as the large flowered vandas that are bare root and need to be watered every day. Uh, pest and disease, they are fairly, fairly uh, 
party to pests and disease. Uh, occasionally, you might have uh, mealybugs uh, or a little bit of scale. Uh, and disease-wise, not too many issues, although you can get crown rot or, or rotting uh, bacterial rot in the leaves or stems. So you just have to watch that. A potting medium, uh, I already mentioned that I pot in just bark, usually a chunky bark, a uh, very open bark media, uh, but you could also use rock mix or, or, or you can do them in baskets without any media, or you can mount some of them as well. So then the last uh, portion is uh, showing you repotting of the mini and compact bandas. Uh, and they primarily the species do have a lot of root growth and they tend to be, um, they tend to root out of the pot. Uh, and so here I have a plant that obviously is growing well, but a lot of the roots are on the outside of the pot. Uh, I like to try and put the roots back into the pot. Uh, it's just easier to take care of the plants. Uh, otherwise, the roots tend to grow into the to the neighboring pots, and you get a you get a big tangled mess after a while. So what I do is I wet the roots, and you can see they turn green after you wet them, uh, and they become more pliable, and they they will bend much easier if they're wet. So I am able to fit them all into the other pot. <coughs> And then I just put the chunky bark into the pot. I don't have to tamp it down or anything really forcefully or, or pack it down in any way because uh, they like a lot of air around the roots. Uh, and then I make sure I label the plant. This happens to be a Neostylus lucinary. Uh, this is the house of mini vandas. This is a little structure that I built uh, or, uh, outside my home. Uh, it's eight feet long, four feet wide, uh, and it has a, uh, a uh, Lexan paneled roof uh, with a luminate shade cloth, and then greenhouse plastic that covers most of it except the door is left open. And uh, I'm able to grow these uh, uh, in Southern California. I'm able to grow them outside without any heating or um, or cooling. If you want to learn more, uh, I did write a couple articles. One was in the Orchids magazine, August 2012. That happens to be my uh, plant on the cover of the magazine. Uh, and then in the Orchid Digest, the fall issue of 2017 shows the big banda hybrid on the cover. I have a nice article in there as well. And I always encourage you to join the American Orchid Society and the Orchid Digest, uh, very fine publications and societies to join. Uh, I have my website, it's uh, www.diamondorchids.com. Uh, my email address is lynn.peterT, T as in Tom, at yahoo.com. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen, and then we can have any questions. You, you, you might have to unmute yourself to ask your question. Thanks, Peter. That was great. That was quite a show. <laughs> I had a question. You know, I should have yeah. recognized this, but I, I never realized. I always thought of Sidera like a Phalaenopsis, and I never really made the connection. I guess completely that fails would cross with Vandas <laughs> or yeah. relationship there to you were showing those hybrids. So, um, yeah, you know, the Sideria has been moved to a Phalaenopsis. But again, I'm one of those people saying, what? It doesn't look like a Phalaenopsis. Um, it doesn't really grow like a Phalaenopsis, but whatever. Uh, but there are some Phalaenopsis that will breed uh, with the other members of the Vanda Alliance. Uh, not always very compatible. Sometimes you get a lot of uh, plants that don't bloom uh, or they have deformed flowers. So I think there's some incompatibility between Phalaenopsis and the other Vanda Alliance, um, but there are some. Uh, 
Uh, but it seems like Sideria uh, is, is more fertile with other Vanda Alliance than true Thalanopsis are. <clears throat> Any questions? Uh, I had a uh, question. Oh. I, John, go ahead. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, I love the picture of the house of mini Vandas. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious, so I'm like experimenting with growing semi outdoors like that too in Southern California. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you know about like what percentage humidity it is in there during the day? And do you do anything specific to keep that from spiking up and down or going too low? Yeah, you know, uh, I'm in, I'm near Los Angeles area and our humidity in Southern California can be quite low, especially in the fall when we have Santa Ana winds. It's not uncommon to have less than 10% humidity. Uh, I've never measured the humidity in the little house. Uh, however, it's gotta be a little bit more than the outside humidity. Um, and so uh, these, Vanda, Vanda species and hybrids are, are, are they're pretty tolerant of low humidity. Um, but if it's really dry, I will tend to use my little misting wand and I'll mist down the entire house. Uh, and that seems to help with, with the dryness. Um, but yeah, I don't really do too much with, temp with climate control in that little house. Wow, okay, that's awesome, thank you. Uh, um, Peter, I'm just curious about how long it takes from deflasking the seedlings until you get a flowering mm. plant. Yes, it, it depends. Now, uh, the, the, the Hoko van Stylus ping pong that I showed at the end of the hybrid section, uh, those were very fast. Uh, they were less than... Uh, less than a year and a half out of flask, they started to bloom. Uh, now, wow. the, the true Neophenicia species is slow. I've had, I've had Neophenicias in, in the flask for over two years, and they were only, only half an inch tall. Uh, and they, they take you know, a good three to four years to bloom from, from flask. So it just depends on what the hybrid is and and uh, and uh, what the makeup of the hybrid is. Thank you. I've got two questions. Sure. Where were those growing on the tree limb? Where did you find those? Well, that's a picture I found on the on a, on a Neo Neopanisha group page, but uh, that's somewhere in Japan. Okay. And what do you use for fertilizer? Uh, what do I use for fertilizer? Uh, because I use uh, reverse osmosis treated water, which is basically pure water, I use the Michigan State University formula fertilizer okay. uh, because they add calcium, magnesium, and other uh, particulates to the, to the water. OK, I have a couple that grow on my windowsill, and they bloom a couple of times a year. Right. So I'm just curious what else yeah. I can do to encourage them. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Peter. Yeah. Um, would you mind commenting just on some of the, particularly the species of how much you rest them in the winter time, you know, kind of a more wet dry cycle, mm -hmm. or if you kind of keep them in with an even moisture cycle year round? Uh, yeah, in, in general, I will reduce the watering pretty much uh, in the winter time, um, in, probably in half. So if I'm watering once a week uh, in the growing period, I won't, I'll only water maybe every two weeks in the, in the winter time. Uh, many of the uh, species tend to go semi-dormant in the winter, they really slow down. The, even the root tips will kind of close over uh, and then they don't start actively growing until the spring. 
Um, so uh, some, some of it depends on the species as well. Now the Neophoenicias tend to want some of a, a dry rest, uh, but the hybrids are, are a little bit more indifferent to any resting. Okay, are there any that are particularly like allergic to getting, usually my problem is not underwatering, it's watering a little too much in the wintertime. Are there any that really, you know, particularly like Holco Glossums or any of them that really kind of resent wintertime water or is that, is there, is there nothing in there that you'd be like, absolutely don't water them? No, there's nothing that says you don't water them at all. Okay. You know, they're not completely dry, but it is possible to overwater them in the winter. You know, if you're watering too much, you might get a little, you might experience some crown rot uh, where the center of the, of the leaf will rot out. Um, now, the only good thing about the Vanda Alliance is that if you get crown rot and you lose the growing point, uh, oftentimes you'll have basal growth come out at the, at the base of the plant or on the side of the plant. So not all is lost if you have, if you lose the crown. Thank you. I have a question. This is Karen. Sure. Um, I have a Hoka glossum, is it called Wangii? W-A-N? Wangii. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, I, I got it from um, Werner um, from China. Anyway, mm -hmm. it, it has the long needle leaves and yep. uh, I only have like maybe four leaves. And it seems like every winter I'll lose one leaf and I'll get new ones and it does bloom mm -hmm. with a short spike. Um, but is it kind of common to lose a leaf or am I maybe not keeping it wet enough? Are you, how are you growing it? Is it potted or mounted? It's mounted on, on a small piece of, um, I think, tree fern bark, and then now it's grown onto uh, something I have attached to. Okay. And uh, is there a nice root growth? I would say it has pretty good root growth. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that some of the Hoka Glossum species tend to uh, not have a lot of leaves at the same time. Um, for example, that Hoka Glossum fungii. Uh, constantly is losing leaves as it gains new leaves. So I only have maybe three leaves at any given time. So I think it's it's probably okay that you're experiencing some leaf loss. Uh, it might just be the, the plant, you know, doing its thing. Um, but I would I would tend to water less during the winter though. Um, so yeah. hopefully, you know, as long as you still have healthy roots, then then losing some leaves is probably not a problem. I do have that in my area with all my other mounts, and it is mm -hmm. attached, like I said, to a, a grape vine um, piece also, so I can't remove it. And so oh, I do yeah. probably, oh, three times a week in the winter, that section. So it might yeah. be getting water in the winter. Yeah, it might be a little too much water in the winter. Okay. Maybe I'll shield it with my hand while I'm watering. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was a really good presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks, Peter. And I want to thank Peter as well um, and encourage people to check out his website, um, especially those of you who hold on to the end of the night after show and tell, since I mentioned at the beginning, I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, the announcement page real quick for those that missed the very beginning, uh, that we have 16 $25 gift codes, gift, gift certificates coming from Peter. So um, in addition to the 10, from tiny $20 ones from Tiny Jungle and a $35 gift code from uh, Farm Fresh to you. So we want to thank Peter for that as well as taking the time and doing the talk. And um, we're going to transition to Lynn Morell to go through show and tell. So, and um, See, also, I may be checking with in with people to remind, I want to remind you that uh, if you missed the announcements at the beginning to win the raffle, 
your dues have to be paid. I know there's been some back and forth on folks. So if you have questions like chat me or let, <clears throat> in the chat, let us know. But um, uh, yeah, let us know. We're, we're going see. through to check all that. It's this, right? Mm -hmm. just in that you Thank you, Peter, very, very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Okay, can you see me? Yes, ma'am. And can you hear me? Yes. Tom, wait, wait, wait. Okay. So um, here we go. We have another gorgeous and really varied show and tell. A lot of um, orchids that we saw Peter present tonight. We have 78 stunning orchid photos from 27 contributors and several really fun pet and orchid photos. So let's get started. Uh, just as a reminder, the order that I show them in is the order in which I receive them. And uh, just a reminder, at the end, I like to show um, an animal picture, your animals with orchids. So please send me yours. Okay, okay we're not changing screens here. Just give me a second. There we go. So we're going to start off with Johnny Langland showing us uh, Rinko Lelia Ketlea Satomi Yasui, which is RLC Pastoral by Ketlea Commander. She says she won this plant in the 2019 POS show raffle, the only year that she's ever won anything in that raffle, but it was worth the wait. Uh, it's a complex hybrid with lots of big, beautiful Ketlea trianii and labiata in its background. It's really a stunner. This is Chani's Dendrochylum wenzelii. It's 75 centimeters across or about 30 inches. And she says she hopes to have a real specimen plant in two or more years. I would consider this about a specimen plant already. She's been growing it since 2012 from a small piece that she bought from Anna Chai. The beauty of this Dendrochylum is that the inflorescences dry up and they just come out with a gentle tug. So it's an easy cleanup chore. And another beauty of this one is that she doesn't have to, it grows pretty uniformly in her greenhouse, so she doesn't have to turn it a lot. It's a low elevation warm grower from the Philippines. This is Chinese Catlea, previously known as Lelia. Lindii, Linnea, has an HCC. And in fact, Jeff Trimble, who many of us know, had this clone awarded in 1988 with 53 flowers. Chani bought a piece in 2008 from Barry Zimmerman and it's growing in a 12 centimeter plastic net pot in sphagnum moss. And it's about 22 inches across, basically a giant dome right now. And she's hoping for a ball eventually. Lundii is a small um, epiphyte, leaves are only about five inches tall. And it's from Brazil in the drier inland areas, far from the coast. And interestingly enough, it's the only Brazilian Lelia with more than one leaf on a pseudopod. The flowers are about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half, and they last about 10 days, but they are adorable while they last. This is Kathy Barris, let me try to pronounce this, Pro, Pro Guarhalalia, Blue Adagio, and she's looking for some advice. Kathy says, quote, it is virused, and I've been trying to self it in order to get seed using dry pod technique. I've tried it three times and the pods have all blasted within three to four days. So I'm hoping an SFOS member might have a bit of wisdom or juju to get this thing to hold a pod. <laughs> Some say spit on the pollen or stigmatic surface. Some say only pollinate at the full moon, really. Uh, but heck, except for the fact that we're in California and there aren't any virgins around here, I'd even try sacrificing one of them. So if anybody has any advice, please use chat 
to respond at the bottom of your screen, or you can um, email Kathy directly. Interesting flower. This is the first time Andrea Laudat has bloomed a catacetum, and she's understandably excited about this catacetum Chuck Taylor. This is a Fred Clark creation, a hybrid of catacetum denticulatum, which gives the lip those toothy margins, and catacetum portage star. Catacetum is a large genus from um, Central and South America. They're great windowsill plants because they want no, no, no water from the time they drop their leaves in the fall until their new leaf, till the new roots, which develop after the flowers are done, till the new roots are about four inches long and then lots of water and fertilizer during the growing season. And Tiny Jungle has some wonderful uh, catechisms for sale online. Tom Pickford shows us his Dendrobium speciosum, a species from Australia, which can grow to the size of a Volkswagen. This is not a windowsill orchid. It needs bright light as much as 4,500 foot candles and very cool to cold nights in its habitat. It grows on rocks or high on rainforest trees with strong air movement. And it's exposed to frost, snow, dry west wind in the winter, and searing heat in the summer. While the Australian species and their hybrids like year-round watering, I find that if you withhold water just while they're blooming, the flowers will last a little longer for you. And these are very fragrant, by the way. This is Tom's Dendrobium Victorian Blush Savine, which was awarded and named after my granddaughter in 2017. It's a complex hybrid of a half dozen Australian species, but as you can probably tell, it's about 75% Kingianum. There's also Tetragonum in this hybrid. Tetragonum is used a lot in hybridizing to get these bright saturated colors. All of the Kingianum hybrids are great outdoor growers for us in the Bay Area, as they need cool nighttime temperatures to initiate these vibrant flowers, or as Tom does, he grows it in a cool greenhouse, which goes down in the low 40s at night. Wow, this is Tom's Lycasti Abu Sunset Good Stuff, on which he was awarded an 81 point AM AOS a year ago. It's a complex hybrid, um, but about 75% of it is Lycasti virginalis. It has stunning shape and color. I think the profile of these flowers is even more beautiful than the head on view of the flower. Again, Tom grows this in his cool greenhouse with nighttime temps into the low 40s. This seems to just get lovelier every year. This is Tom's Mazdavalia triangularis. It's a charming little uh, mist forest species found in Venezuela, Ecuador, and Colombia up to about 9,800 feet. So it is a cool grower. It's small, up to about six inches tall, so it could be a good windowsill candidate. The flowers are only about an inch and a half wide, but nearly five inches long, top to bottom, including the, the tails or caudae. This is very well-grown plant, so kudos to Tom for this one, which he grows on the water wall in his cool greenhouse, so it gets more water than most of his plants. These are Chris Nietro's amazing Orpheus speculum. I have, I have Orpheus envy. Orpheus is a genus of about 20 terrestrial species, mostly from Southern Europe and Northern Africa, and they're commonly called bee orchids because the flowers look like those insects. On the left is Chris's Orpheus, 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 sorry, speculum from Greece, and the lighter one in the center is from France. Chris found the photo on the right online, and it shows Orpheus speculum next to its pollinating wasp, Daisy scolia ciliate. We can clearly see why this poor wasp is deceived into trying to mate with the flower and in doing so pollinating the orchid, but not getting much personal satisfaction. Chris, this deserves a real round of applause. These it does, right. yes. Let's hear it. <laughs> Here's another one of Chris's Ophrys. This is Spagotis. This one has a slightly larger flower up to an inch. It's cold growing terrestrial found throughout Europe in the grasslands and meadows up to about 4,200 feet. And it's named after a 19th century Bavarian botanist. Chris shows us two cultivars of Fel amboinensis. On the left, we see two of the, the two side by side and then each one separately. 
The darker clone is Teja's Giant, which has been awarded an award of merit by AOS. The lighter, the lighter uh, clone is Tiger. Amboinensis is a warm grower from Indonesia. It needs only moderate light to bloom as well as these two plants of Chris's. In my experience, these are much fussier than the hybrid fails that we see everywhere, but they're rewarding if you can provide the conditions they want. I have a particular problem if there's water left between those leaves. The leaves are very close on top of one another, and that can cause some root and some mold in there. And this is Chris's Wrinkle Stylus Gigantea. We saw some of these from um, our speaker just now. This is a cross of two clones, which have received many awards in Europe, red and spots. And Chris gives us a good culture tip. Look inside the pot there. Since he started growing his Rinko Stylus potted in a mixture of Lika and cocoa husk chips, they've really taken off and you can get a glimpse of that here. Lika, L-E-C-A, is an acronym for lightweight expanded clay aggregate or porous baked clay balls, which you can find online. Larry Robert shows us Bialara or Alciara, Tahoma Glacier, which is a very complex hybrid with any number of Oncidium, Miltonia, and Brassia species contributing to this lovely flower, as you can see from the genealogy pie chart in the bottom. <clears throat> Larry says it has 15 flowers and it has a pleasant peppery fragrance. This is a good window, so candidate with hybrid vigor and reliable blooming. Deborah Bell's Qualter shows us this copper and burgundy Cymbidium hybrid. This one's putting on a nice show for her growing outdoors on her deck. And another of Deborah's Cymbidium hybrids. This one has very lovely uh, lavender pink lip with bur deep burgundy spots, which contrast beautifully with the creamy sepals and petals. Very nice, Deborah. And this is Deborah's Lelia canariensis which is a primary hybrid of Lelia anseps, which you see on the right, crossed with um, Harpophylla, also on the right. So it gets its shape, the flower shape, and also the lip shape, primarily from the anseps side of the family, as you can see, and the color it gets from the Harpophylla for a lovely, cool-growing winter bloomer. This is another good candidate for outdoor growing in the Bay Area, Canariensis. Andrew Smith shows us this very cool, Bulbophyllum camosum, which is one of the few deciduous bulbos. It blooms on fully deciduated pseudobulbs, and the dangling inflorescence has many hairy um, cream-colored flowers, which are, they are fragrant, although that's not always a good thing with, with bulbos. Uh, it wants fairly warm temperatures and low light, so it's a candidate for indoor growing, uh, as long as you remember not to put it in the compost pile when the, when the last leaf falls off in the fall. It needs a dry winter west winter rest for blooming. Very cute. Judy Carney shows us three color forms of Dendrobium tetragonum, which she grows in her cool greenhouse. The one on the left is a very dark form of tetragonum. The one in the center is unusual, unusually floriferous. That is a wow and some applause. And the one on the right is an unusual albinistic form. The name tetragonum is due to the four-sided or square pseudobulb, which I think you can see in the, the left, left. Well, I guess in all the photos, you can see that the, the uh, pseudobulbs are square. This hails from Southeastern Australia, and the dark forms are often used in hybridizing with other Australian dendrobiums to bring vibrant color to the hybrids. The inflorescence can rebloom, so don't rush to remove it, and it is fragrant too. Nice, Judy. This is Judy's Orangus hyaloides, the name meaning transparent or glassy. It has glistening white flowers. They're about three quarters of an inch um, that are really beautiful against the dark green glossy leaves. This is a species from Madagascar from sea level to about a thousand meters. So it's a warm grower and likes fairly low light with good humidity. This is a miniature, so a good windowsill um, orchid if you can provide the humidity for it. This is Judy's Prosthecia sima, a piece of a plant on which Lil Severin, if that name is familiar to you, Lil received a CBR right here in San Francisco 25 years ago. It was formerly known as Encyclia sima and also Anachylum sima. 
when all of the all of the non resupinates were moved to anachylum. Non resupinate means that the flowers have the lip projecting upwards instead of downwards. So no, um, Judy's photos are not upside down here. This is a little species found in Panama and Colombia, a worm grower that prefers medium light. Dan Newman had one of these on the display at our last POE, if you noticed it, and it was even more striking in person. This is Judy's Dendrochylum papilio, which she purchased as a seedling, seedling from Jason Fisher. <clears throat> Judy says she moved this from her cool greenhouse after 10 years, and now it seems happy and is blooming with the warmer temperatures in her intermediate house. It has three open flowers and three buds currently. It's a species from the Philippines, and it's found up to 7,200 feet, so you would think it would like the cool temperatures, but Judy's successful blooming at warmer temperatures is a good culture tip. It looks like Judy's is growing it mounted on a large um, slab or stick. And you may remember Tom Perlidi's plant at POE last February with over 200 crepey flowers, and he was awarded a CCE, Certificate of Cultural Excellence on it. Beautiful flower. <clears throat> wow. So Roberta Fox shows us two Australian terrestrials, Diurus magnifica and Diurus orient orientis, the so-called donkey orchids. And you can see why they're called donkey orchids. Just look at those ears. They're dormant from approximately May to October with no water. And Roberta says she starts watering in late October when the nights start to cool off. She grows them definitely outdoors and they get as much as three to four hours a day in the strong sunlight. The medium she uses is about 85 to 90% inorganic, such as pumice. She likes pumice better than perlite because it makes the pot heavy enough that it doesn't tip over when it's dry. And the balance of the medium is um, a well-drained potting soil, so not bark. We rarely see these in collections in the US, but Roberta's photos are a real enticement if you can remember that um, the dry rest happens in summer, which is the opposite of what we're used to for dry rest as they come from down under. Roberta has another uh, delightful Ophrys for us. This is her Ophrys 10th Redinifera, native to most of the countries bordering the Mediterranean. It grows in grassy and stony scrublands. It's another one of the bee orchids because it looks like a bee, and it needs the same culture as the Australian terrestrials, dry summer rest, wet winter, except that Roberta also adds a bit of crushed limestone to the mix of this one to make it a little alkaline since these grow in calcareous soils. This is Roberta, Roberta's Campanula orchis globifera, a native to Vietnam at elevations around 1400 meters. It's related to Uria and Roberta grows it outdoors on her Southern California patio, probably not up here in the Bay Area. The buds and flowers are woolly, fuzzy, and the flowers are about an inch or to an inch and a half. Her plant is growing in a six inch bulb pan, um, but it's rambling around and she says soon it'll be ready to move up to a bigger pot. Lily Go shows us an unidentified selogeny species. If anybody can identify this for Lily, please use chat on your screen and let her know. Selogeny is a large Asian genus of about 200 species found in all four climes, uh, warm growing species, like Pandurata and Speciosa require no winter rest, while the cool growers do need a dry winter rest, which makes sense. The hybrids are, of course, more forgiving, and selogenies are a great choice for any orchid collection. This is beautiful. This is Dave Hermeyer's Dendrobium delicatum, which is an interesting natural hybrid. Natural hybrid means that the cross originally happened in nature. Um, between Dendrobium kingianum and Dendrobium tarberi, found in Queensland and New South Wales on rocks and boulders and cliff faces. It's very highly awarded, including many awards in Australia, of course. The flower is about an inch with a pleasant minty scent. This is Dave's fabulous Hocal Glossum subulifolium. This is a really beautifully grown plant, deserves a round of applause. Let's hear it. There are, as um, we heard, there are about 15 species in this terete leaf vanda like genus from Southeast Asia. This one's a little bit bigger than the ones that Peter showed us. 
The flowers on some eulifolium are about an inch and a half, and the roughly fringed spoon-shaped lip is really the showstopper. It's found at a range of elevations, so it's pretty adaptable. It needs just medium light. And our speaker next month, Wen Ching Perner, often has focal blossoms on her sale list, so you'll want to watch for something as beautiful as this. Susan Anderson shows us her Trichopilia suavis. Suavis meaning sweetly fragrant, and the flower is very sweet and beautiful too. This is a species from Panama, Costa Rica, and into Colombia. Susan grows it in her intermediate greenhouse with nighttime temperatures down to about 58 degrees. Diffuse light and water year round work well for this orchid and the flowers, which are about four and a half to five inches, they last about three weeks. You hardly notice the petals and the sepals on these flowers because it's all about the showy, roughly lip with the bright cerise blotches and the yellow throat attracting the pollinator to come hither. Susan Anderson shows us her Cattleya Intermedia or Lada. This is a cross of Pedra, I'm sorry, Cattleya Intermedia, which is a cross of Orlada Pedra Azul by Intermedia Quantum. Um, Susan is crazy about intermedias, and these large showy flowers are the reason why. Intermedia is a medium-sized cat from Brazil found in the Atlantic coastal forest. The leaves of intermedia, just an interesting point, have a jagged edge to the touch. So you can always tell that it's an intermediate by just running your fingers along the edges. There are many color forms of intermedia from white to vinny color, and also several types with flushes or flares of color in the sepals and petals. Um, all orchid collections should include an intermediate or six. Susan is sticking with her pink theme tonight with this Ascocentrum Christensonianum, which Peter also just showed us. And it's now, of course, called Vanda Christensoniana, named for one of our once local departed orchid friends, Eric Christensen. It's a warm grower from Vietnam, needs bright light to flower as well as Susan's is. This is a good windowsill candidate, as Peter said, as the plant is small for a Vanda. It's only about maybe 12 inches tall. The flowers are half an inch across with a crystalline texture. Uh, water year round, but as Peter said, less in the winter, and it does like good air movement. This is Susan's Vanda Surulescence, or pink form. <clears throat> They're typically lavender with a violet lip. So this is a more unusual color form of Surulescence. This is a compact eight inch plant. And it's one of the Vandas which needs somewhat of a dry winter rest, at least for a couple of months in early spring until the new growth starts. It grows as an epiphyte in Southeast Asia at a range of elevations up to about 5,000 feet but in all locations, it receives very bright light. The leaf color is a good indicator, according to the Baker notes. Long, deep green leaves indicate the light levels are too low, whereas short, pale, yellow-green leaves that do not open fully indicate too much light. So there you have that. Renate Johnson shows us Cymbidium yaumanica, a lovely complex hybrid with nicely arranged flowers and a beautiful deep burgundy lip with just a little pink picotee along the edge of the lip. She took this photo with her iPhone to capture the color because it caught it better than her DSL camera could. This is Jeff Harris's Dendrobium Cuthbertsonii, a cross of two clones, Lafayette by Purple Jungle. Lafayette is a clone Steve Beckendorf had awarded in 1995, an AM of 84 points. Jeff got this plant a few years ago from John Leathers at a Pleurothalid Alliance Opportunity Table, and it blooms for him November through April with just weekly waterings. He grows it in his cool fog house under his deck. Cuthbertsonii is obviously a miniature species. It's from Papua New Guinea at elevations up to 11,000 feet on mossy rocks near streams. And Jeff has obviously found the way to replicate that environment, uh, cool and humid. I found these a little hard to grow for more than a couple of years and they kind of peter out for me. They just don't, because they just don't tolerate um, prolonged high temperatures, but I'm always tempted to try again. This is Jeff Vandico Stylus Charm, uh, which used to be Darwinara, as Peter said. <clears throat> Jeff said it's quite fragrant and it smells like gardenias to him. He grows it in his warm, humid greenhouse where it blooms twice a year 
now and again in August. And you can see from the genealogy on the right where it gets its stellate shape and also where it gets its striking amethyst coloring. It needs bright light so we can see that Jeff has it hanging high in his greenhouse. This is Jeff's Vanda Motes Blue Yonder. It's a cross of Vanda Amalena by Vanda Curvifolia, made by Martin Motes and just registered in 2019. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need to take a sip here. Sorry. And it already has two AOS awards. The color is a rich dark violet with underlying darker veins or tessellations. I think you'll see them more on the one on the right. And it also has distinctive yellow side lobes. Jeff says this is a new acquisition from Moats Orchids in Florida. And he has two sprays of these full round flowers, which are each about two inches across. <clears throat> Winnie Wang shows us this Paphiopetalum hybrid. She bought this at POE a few years ago and it blooms every year at this time. It's a successive bloomer as we can see. And Winnie says it used to just bloom with one flower open at a time. This is the first time she's had three flowers on the stem at the same time. Although you can see that the one, the first one, the one in back is turning yellow is probably gonna fade and drop off soon. This is Winnie's pink cymbidium, which she got from Costco. So it doesn't have a name, but it's lovely nonetheless. I'm very partial to uh, light shell pink cymbidiums and the delicate spotting on the lip is really lovely. <clears throat> this is another of Winnie's Costco cymbidiums. She says this one has a light and pleasant fragrance, which she finds very special. It looks like it has at least four spikes. Winnie also sent me a short video of a hummingbird sipping the honeydew from one of her cymbidiums, but I couldn't figure a way to download um, a video onto PowerPoint. So I'm sorry, we'll, we'll miss that. Tanya Lamb shows us Cattleya lotogesii, which is a species from Brazil where it's found at about 2,000 to 3,000 feet. So this is an in indoor or intermediate temperature grower and a very rewarding um, addition to any collection. It's round flat shape and full petals and sepals make lotogesii an important Cattleya for breeding. And it's been used in over 9,900 hybrids, including 450 primary hybrids. The flowers are about four inches. They're quite long lasting and they're also fragrant. Tanya also shows us a Cymbidium sinense, which is a semi-terrestrial species from Eastern China and throughout the mountains of Taiwan, where it's found in partial shade in forests near streams or seepage. So that's a clue to how to grow it. Cool temperatures like most of the Cymbidiums we love to grow outdoors in the Bay Area. The flowers are about three inches across and they are fragrant. And this is Tanya's Cymbidium, I'm sorry, Oncidium splendidum, um, a species from Nicaragua and Honduras where it grows on rocky hillsides below 3000 feet. So this is a warm grower. It's a relatively small plant, about 12 to 14 inches. So you could grow it on your windowsill if you have space for the long inflorescence, which can be uh, three, to feet, three to four feet tall branched uh, but with lots of two inch striking yellow flowers. It needs bright diffuse light and much less water during the winter months. This is Tanya's Paphiopetalum sukaculei, a species from Thailand. <clears throat> it has 240 AOS awards. It was really all the rage a few years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it's been used extensively in breeding because of the very horizontal spotted petals and the clear striping on the dorsal sepal. You can see the tiny hairs along the margins of the petals, probably to deter some dastardly predator. And this is Tanya's Paphiopetalum appletonianum, also found in Thailand and even more extensively in Laos, Cambodia, and China. I hadn't he heard this term before, but this is called a hummus, or maybe it's humus. I don't think it eats garbanzo beans. A humus, hummus epiphyte, meaning that its roots are usually buried in deep leaf litter and leaf mold up in the trees where it grows. There are darker color forms than this, but I think that Tanya's pale pink with the light chartreuse dorsal sepal and the peachy lip, I think it's very lovely. Just a few little polka dots. This is Tanya's Papilionanda nanthaburi, 
This is a hybrid of Propiliananda, Josephine von, von Brera uh, by Gulfstream of Siam, crossed with Gul Vanda Gulfstream of Siam. And it has all of the great color markings and lip of the best of its parents. It shows us really radiant sunset colors here. It's unusual. Jeffrey Doney shows us Vanda Lamellata, a big Vanda with a plant up to a couple of feet plus a foot long inflorescences. He says it blooms for him every year in February and the flowers last for about two months. He has three spikes this year, which is super. Jeffrey also shows us Ascosenda Ben's Delight Coffee, which has, has been awarded an AM AOS in Florida. This is another large Vanda with a large sturdy flower spike and well-arranged flowers. They're all facing out nicely. They're not crowded together. The award description calls the coffee color chocolate milk with a copper patina, which is interesting. Very nice. And this is Jeffrey's Drop Dead Orange Catlea Hybrid, which he purchased from Tom Perliti 25 years ago, and it currently has 13 spikes. It is shown off beautifully in that metal pot. Jeffrey boards his orchids at White Oak, which is now owned by Brookside, and this is just a beautiful plant, Jeffrey. Allison Fishman, Allie is sending us photos for the first time, and here is her Selogeny intermedia. The name suggests that it's a species, but in fact, Selogeny intermedia is a primary hybrid of Selogeny tomentosa by Selogeny cristata. It was registered in 1913 and has never been awarded by the American Orchid Society. I don't know why, because it has received awards in Colombia and in Germany. The flowers are just a pristine white with that with the yellow keels or ridges on the lip to attract a pollinator. Allison purchased this from the member sales table at POE about three years ago before she joined SFOS, and this is her first blooming. This is Ellie's Paphiopetalum delinatii, which I think is the most charming of all the little path species. It's a native to Vietnam from elevations of uh, 2,500 to 5,000 feet where the nighttime temperatures average in the mid 50s. It receives uh, medium or dappled light. Though I read that some growers give it Cattleya light, the flowers are usually a deeper shade of pink when it's grown at lower light. The foliage is lovely as you can see, um, even when the plant is not in bloom. And this is Allison's second reblooming of it. Allie also shows us her Psychopsis Mendenhall, which she got from Seattle Orchid last July as part of her orchid retail therapy during COVID. I'm guessing that that spike is probably between two and a half and three feet tall, and the flower is about six inches. The clone Hildos has been awarded four times from Toronto to Louisiana to Australia, and it blooms successively, so don't cut that stem until it actually turns brown. I just stare at this amazing flower and wonder what in the world is the pollinator that is drawn to it. Eileen Jackson has just rejoined SFOS, and we're glad to have her back. Just in time to show off her Lycasti Sunray, a gorgeous flower, which is 95% Lycasti virginalis. But Eileen's looks to have fuller sepals than the virginalis parent. <clears throat> um, the flowers are really arranged beautifully here, one on top of another, one above another, I should say. Lycasti is a genus found through Central America and South America, and as you can see, it has big, beautiful pleated leaves. Lycasti virginalis is deciduous, losing its leaves in the fall and watering is then stopped until new growths appear in the winter um, or early spring, and it is fragrant. Jan Anderson shows us Kaisis bractescence. Nice. Somebody say yay. <laughs> Me too, I love it. A species found through Mexico and Central America. It has fat, fusiform pseudobulbs, fusiform meaning that they are spindle shaped, narrowing at both ends, as you can see in the photo on the left. And the flowers are in a tight cluster at the tip of a short inflorescence. Jan grows it in her Paphiopetalum greenhouse, but it's next to the window, so it's cooler, and she gives it less water. It does like a little drier winter to induce blooming. The flowers are about three inches, they're waxy, they're very fragrant. Some color forms of bractescence have peachy overtones or color at the petal tips, but I favor the pure 
uh, the pure white form like Jan's. This is Jan's Potanara William Farrell Dawn Light, which has 25 flowers and buds. That is a wow. She grows it outdoors in her lath house with no heat or cooling, just fans to keep the air moving. As you can see, it's a very complex hybrid with more than eight of the big Catleyas in its background. Jan also shows us Lelio Catlea candy corn, also a complex hybrid with Cat Dubiosa and Trick or Treat as its parents. She also grows this outdoors in her unheated lath house. Glenn Finch shows us Catlea Percivaliana. This is a medium sized Catlea, about 16 inches tall with showy five inch flowers. The typical color form of Percivaliana has light rose pink sepals and petals. So this is considered a semi alba because all of the anthocyanin or red coloring is uh, concentrated in the lip. It has a lovely white picotee around the edges of the lip and the lip interior is um, deep maroon with intense yellow in the throat. This species is from Venezuela and Colombia <clears throat> where it grows as an epiphyte or lithophyte at 1,000 to 2,000 meters. Glenn gives it two rest periods, one, after, one before flowering and one after flowering. He purchased this plant from the Santa Barbara Orchid Estate. This is Glenn's Dendrobium linguiforme, also known as Dacrylia linguiforme. Dacrylia was carved out of Dendrobium, and I don't know if they've moved it back. I'm not changing my tags. The leaves on this are very thick and fleshy, as you can see, and they're said to be tongue-shaped hence the name lingua forme. Glenn purchased this from Peter Lynn. It's an Australian species and it can take very bright light and tolerates a wide range of temperatures. He finds this fairly easy to grow and it is fragrant. This is Glenn's Dendrobium bellatulum, a darling miniature with a flower that's as big as the two inch plant. It's from Southeast Asia. It's a little fussy to grow. It prefers to be mounted as Glenn shows us here, because it has to fully dry out between waterings. And it needs a dry winter rest from about November until it blooms. The flowers are very long lasting. They have a lovely lemon orange scent, but it's really all about that, that day glow orange lip. <clears throat> How would you even begin to describe what's going on inside that lip? There are ruffles, keels, warts, and other protuberances he purchased this from Andy's Orchids, and thanks for a really good photo on this, Glenn. This is my Selogeny leucantha, which I bought in 2019 bare root from our next month speaker, Wenqing Perner. It's a small species native to Yunnan and Sichuan, China, and are up to around 8,000 feet. So I grow it in my cool greenhouse with winter nights into the low 40s and only light water or misting in the winter. This is the first time I've bloomed it and I'm pretty pleased with those flowers. <clears throat> this is my Mastavalia Schroederiana, a cool growing Mastavalia from Costa Rica, found at around 6,000 feet. This is easy to grow, so it's a good windowsill candidate. If you can provide cool winter nights down into the 40s is best, and also just filtered light. This came from Blaine Maynard of Orchids for the People up in McKinleyville, California. Blaine has a pretty robust website. If you're in an orchid shopping mood, orchids for the people. This is my Dendrobium amethystoglossum, a species from the Philippines. It wants warm temperatures, medium light, and much less water from December to March. I purchased this as a pretty good sized seedling from Roy Tokunaga of H&R in 2018. And each year the plant gets larger. The canes are now about two feet tall and it's more floriferous every year. This, I have, this year I have 20 umbels of flowers. The plant is mostly deciduous, but some leaves persist for two years. So I have to say it's not the loveliest plant when it blooms, but the flowers last three to four weeks and they are fragrant. So these are two different dendrobiums that confused the heck out of me until I sat down and studied them side by side. So I thought we might do that here. On the left is Dendrobium capituliflorum, whose name means roughly with flowers like small heads. In Australia, it's known as the white bottle brush orchid. 
It has a relatively flat growth habit, creeping around on the mount, and it has bright green leaves. I purchased this plant from California orchids in 2017. The next year, Judy Carney gave me the plant on the right, labeled Dendrobium capitulifolium. And while I can't find much info about it, clearly it has a very different growth habit with upright canes and purple on the underside of the leaves, though the flower heads look the same, even though they're not fully open here. So I think I have it figured out. The folium refers to the unusual pur purple foliage. If anyone can further demystify or correct this, I would welcome your input via chat or by separate email. Kate Klum shows us Odontoglossum rossii. The taxonomists have pretty much eliminated the genus Odontoglossum these days. They moved most of the species to Oncidium. Uh, rossii is one of a small group of odonts formerly known as Lumboglossum, which they moved to Rhynchostyle. This is a Central American species uh, found at high elevations and Kay grows it in a cool greenhouse so it's a good candidate to grow outdoors in the Bay Area, but it needs to be protected from rain because it wants quite dry during the cold winter months, like many of the high elevation odonts do. This is a small epiphyte with an oversized flower. This is Kay's nicely grown Papstiella mirabilis, which JFAL's IOSPE says is now Pleurothallus mirabilis. In either case, it's a Brazilian miniature, and Mirabilis means it is the wonderful Pleurothallus. The plant's only about four inches tall, <clears throat> and it's best grown mounted, as Kay has it here, to best display the flowers which cascade down. It's a cool to intermediate grower, needs light shade. Some of you may recall that Steve Beckendorf was awarded a CCE, a Cultural Excellence Award, on his plant at POE in 2009. And back to Hocoglossums, this is Kay's Hocoglossum subulifolium. We saw Dave Hermeyer's um, earlier. Kay shows us how vigorous the roots are <laughs> on the left. Uh, one of them actually worked its way through to the back of the mount and then back through to the front of the mount again. This is a species from Vietnam and Southeast Asia found at a range of elevations. So it's pretty adaptable and it needs just medium light Kays grows in an intermediate greenhouse, and our speaker next month, Wen Ching Perner, often has these available on her sale list. This is Kays Oberonia rufolabris. According to Ron Parsons and Mary Gerritsen's Compendium of Miniature Orchard Orchid Species, which you all need to have on your bookshelf, Oberonia was named for Oberon, king of the fairies, who lived hidden in the woods with his kind. Hmm. So Rufalabras derives, the word Rufalabras derives from the fox red lip, which is so tiny we can't see it here. But this is a Himalayan species grown in an intermediate greenhouse, very cute. Jeff Harris, Jeff with a G, shows us Restrepia brachypus. This is a delightful miniature species from South America, found at elevations up to about 10,000 feet. So that tells us that the Restrepias are good Bay Area cool outdoor orchids and shaded to dappled light with good humidity and water all year round. That's a great photo. This is Jeff's Mastabalia tovarensis, endemic to Venezuela. They grow in cloud forests of the coastal mountains near Caracas at elevations of 5,000 to 7,500 feet. So in cultivation, they want cool temperatures, bright filtered light and good air movement. This was first awarded by AOS in 1968 to Lil Severin, again, whom some of you will remember as an active Bay Area orchidist. Hers had 12 flowers and two buds on five inflorescences, which points out that as we can sort of see in Jeff's photo, they, um, it is a, it, there are multiple blooms on a stem, which is somewhat unusual for a Mastavalia. Jeff is going to show us several Cattleya species. The first is Cattleya ludemaniana, named after a 19th century French gardener. This is a big showy ruffly wonder with five to six inch flowers. It's from Venezuela, found at low elevations. So it's best grown intermediate to warm with bright light. These are two Cattleya amethystoglossa with their wonderful spots. 
and consistently beautiful magenta lip. This is, a, excuse me, a Brazilian species, a large plant up to 18 inches tall or so with waxy, slightly fragrant, long lasting flowers. It's a warm grower, needs bright indirect light or filtered light. And it's very highly awarded and used a lot in breeding because it's all about the spots. Jeff's Cattleya Lodigesii is another Brazilian native. Lodigesii is one of the most important Cattleyas for breeding because of its classic shape. Just look at the flower, it's full, round and flat with no spaces between the sepals and petals, no windowing. And uh, it has a lovely long ruffled lip, firm substance and diamond dust texture. Jeff's is a great um, example of Lodigesii. This is Jeff's Cattleya coccinea though most of us will always refer to it as Saphronitis because that evokes a small plant with brilliant red flowers that are typical of the former genus Saphronitis before the taxonomist decided to lump them into Cattleya, unfortunately. This little Brazilian gem grows in the cool, foggy, misty coastal mountains, so they need a lot of moisture and humidity to be successful. Rather bright dappled light, though not direct sun, is needed to flower them well. And I've read that the edges of the leaves will often be purplish when they're receiving the maximum amount of light that they can tolerate without burning. Coccinia are also used a lot in hybridizing, obviously for the color, but also to bring down the plant size when they're crossed with some of the larger uh, Cattleyas. And this is Jeff's Cattleya, formerly Lelia, Eloria. Again, I'm not changing my plant tags. These little bell-shaped gems never open flat, which is part of their charm. The typical color form is lavender pink. So this is an alba form and it's really beautiful. You can see there are five yellow keels inside the or, or ridges inside the lip to direct the pollinator to the prize within. This is a Brazilian worm grower needing only intermediate light. Uh, it's a miniature best grown mounted or in a wood basket as Jeff has it here to accommodate its rambling growth habit does wander around. <clears throat> Nancy Tristan, one of our LA area members, shows us her nicely grown Dendrobium bilotulum. We saw one earlier from Glen Finch. It's a really wonderful miniature from Southeast Asia with a flower that's as big as the two inch plant. It prefers to be mounted as Nancy shows us here uh, because it has to fully dry out between waterings. And it needs dry win winter rest from about November until it flowers. The flowers are very long lasting um, they have a lovely lemon orange scent, but ooh la la, that lip, I love it. Nancy shows us Cymbidium wenchaflor, a primary hybrid, meaning that just two species have been crossed, of Cymbidium wenchanens by Cymbidium floribundum. As you can see on the bottom right, the species names have been combined to get wenchaflor. This is a brand new hybrid just registered by Kevin Hill in 2019, and it's not yet received any awards. <laughs> I actually proposed to Nancy that she take it to um, judging up in Lincoln on uh, Sunday until she reminded me that she lives in Southern California. So that probably wouldn't happen. Um, this is beautiful. It has an elaborate lip it really, that really dominates the flower. There's, there's dots, there's dashes, and there's ruffles in there. And Nancy, it looks like you have at least three inflorescences, maybe four. Nicely done. This is Vincent Pietro Marti Martir's first show and tell showing, and we're delighted to have him. First is his Mastavalia vecchiana, which he acquired more than 15 years ago. It's one of four Mastavalia vecchiana plants that he has, all just starting to flower. He grows his Mastavalias outdoors in the Nopa area of San Francisco and says these Vecchiana flowers last for some time, as long as it's cool and breezy. Vecchiana is endemic to Peru, and many of us have had the great joy of seeing them in Cusco and Machu Picchu up to about 13,000 feet. What we see in the photos are the three orange or vermilion sepals and with their caudae or their tails. And the, the uh, sepals are covered with tiny purple hairs, which we really can't see here. The minuscule petals and the lip are hiding up inside that cavity, waiting for the tiny pollinator to come hither. This is Vincent Cymbidium, which he acquired 15 years ago and which now has five spikes. Unfortunately, the tag is lost. 
He says the true color is more yellow and less creamy and the red orange on the lip is more vibrant. Still very lovely. And this is Vincent's Pleurothallis truncata, a recent acquisition. He read that they thrive in an environment similar to Mazda Valleys, so he's discovered that Pleurothallis do quite well in his backyard. It's making four flower spikes, two of them from the leaf on the right, right hand picture. This is a cool growing species from Ecuador. And like most of the Pleurothallis species, the flower spikes arise from the center of the top or the upper side of the leaf. And they form lovely little chains of here, quarter inch flowers, orange flowers. And now we're gonna go on to the pet parade. We had some great pet photos, pet and orchid photos this month. Here's a nice family photo of Larry Roberts and his dog Judy with a lovely Bialara Tahoma Glacier that we saw earlier. This photo really shows how huge those flowers are. They're almost as big as Judy's face. Very cute dog. And this is Kay's cat Peaches, admiring the little Barcaria, which Kay purchased from MAS Orchids after last month's talk by Dennis Seiko and Robert Marsh. Dave Hermeyer asked Kay what peaches' growing conditions are, and Kay responded, in the lap of luxury. Indeed. These are Chani's two beautiful kitties, Zorro and Rory, enjoying their supervised outdoor time in the backyard with an RLC Olympus Sunset FCA. Chani says, of course, they, of course, they were not nearly as interested as if the plant were indoors and as if she were not watching them. And finally, to close, this is Allison Fishman's Winnie, her four-month-old sheepadoodle who loves to nap next to her orchid setup. Allie has caught her sniffing some of the fragrant fowls, but so far she hasn't made a snack out of them. I Googled sheepadoodle and I found that it's a primary hybrid in orchid speak of an old English sheepdog and a poodle. And the breed is also known as sheepapoo and sheepdog poo. Interesting name. She is adorable and it looks like she's gonna be a big girl. So thank you all for the wonderful photos. Stay well and stay well amused. Lynn, amazing, always amazing. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Lynn, thank you. That's, I love doing it. Thank you for the photos. <laughs> You're so good at it. Um, wow, so we have 64 people going strong here. So that's good. There were like 70 something at the peak. Um, so I just want to let people know that uh, in the background, because we have like, what is it, 30, 20, 37 things to give away. No, 27 things to give away. <laughs> so um, I wanted to just let you know what I did in the background is I used a random number generator and a spreadsheet. So John Rushworth helped me get everyone in here on a spreadsheet numbered from one to whatever, one to 60 or whatever. And we put it in here and sorted out the folks that had paid up their dues and it generates all these numbers. And then I go to the spreadsheet. And so that's how we've done the raffle because there's just too many names <laughs> to do it quickly. So just wanted some transparency because people always ask. So here are the winners and I'll email you afterwards. One of you will win the uh, $35 Farm Fresh to You gift certificate. Um, 10 will get $20 Tiny Jungle gift certificates. And the other 16 will get the $25 Diamond Orchid gift certificates from Peter Lynn, tonight's speaker. So the winners are, drum roll, let's see here. Beth McDowell, Bill Dice, Carl Fisher, uh, Sherry Wagner, Chris Nitro, Claire Zavansky, Corey Majewski, Dave Hermeyer, <clears throat> David Anderson, Eileen Jackson, Faye Rabino, Heidi Arno, Jan Anderson, Jen Pulakis, John Russell McCallan, Judy Carney, Kat Chang, um, I lost my place, Kay Klum, Larry Roberts, <clears throat> Lisa Perla, Lynn Morell, um, Mary Gerritsen, um, Mira Alinsky, Chiming uh, Rick uh, Yang, and Roberta Fox, Tom Pickford, 
and Valerie Mountain. So uh, congratulations to everyone. Glad that we could uh, get things out to so many people. And um, just wanted to let you know next month again is uh, Wenjin from China. She did take orders through February 20th for sales that could be shipped in March. And we'll take another order for later in the year for um, things that could be sent, I think, in November. Right. And Mary, uh, I think you were on when I did the announcement about we're taking uh, names for the book order. So any other announcements before we sign off? Any final words? So how do we get our names for the book order for? Um, oh, you let for me know. So send me an email or I'll write your name down here. So that was, was that? I'm a Andrew Mc, I'm a okay. Say one more time. Well, I'm looking Andrew, for you. Andrew, Andrew Smith. Smith. Right. And this is her and Ron's miniature. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Please. Okay. <laughs> Can't believe it's the first time. All right. I'll follow up with you by email. Thank any you. Other, any other folks want to be on a list or have questions? Claire? Jeff, what, which book? I missed uh, beginning to. Oh, oh. Well, let me just show you guys. So real quick, let, there's a few announcement things you might, won't want to miss. Let's see here. Uh, Sorry. No, 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 no problem. Um, okay, so if we look here, uh, so Mary and Ron are putting out a second edition of their Compendium of Miniature Orchid Species. It's a four book compendium. Um, and we're trying to get 10 names of folks so we can place a group order to save some money on the purchase as well as the shipping costs. So it's still a little rough. It'll probably end up being <clears throat> uh, about $40 savings off of what should be uh, Actually, I think it's $300 per set of four, including shipping, roughly. We still have to figure out the exact shipping. And we're hoping to get a discount of about 40 bucks per set, but we're not sure yet. So we just need to know if you're interested, and then I'll follow up on the rest, and we'll know what we owe. It looks like Florence is interested. <laughs> so, Jeff, just to, just to be clear on, on this, the set of books is priced in pounds, not dollars. And the price of the set of books without the discount is 299 pounds, which is about 360, I don't know what the latest. Ah, is. okay. And on top of that, the books are gonna weigh well over 30 pounds. Yeah. So shipping from England is not gonna be cheap. So what we're doing is offering a substantial discount to the Orchid Society if you order 10. Um, first on the book, and then I think we should be able to save some money on bulk shipping as well. So Mary, when when will it um, come out? <laughs> Soon. <laughs> so we're at, we're, we're at the point right now where we're, um, um, we've done the final layout and just fixing, because we changed the page sizes and had to update the taxonomy and do a whole bunch of other things. The page layout has become um, uh, a nightmare, but we're getting there. And I think we're shooting towards uh, probably the second week of March that we'll go off to the printers. The printer is in India. So depending on, you know, the COVID situation in India is pretty grim right now too. And so, I don't know how much that's going to impact our printing and shipping, but once it's printed, which doesn't take that long, it will be shipped back to England and then it'll be available for everybody. And Jeff, would you mind if I, I, I don't want to be a big plug here, but I thought I'd share the screen because um, I want to show you the new layout. Ron came up with this idea and I think it's just absolutely fabulous. So if I could share that with you. Yeah. This one. Of course. Look at it. And the, um, the website is uh, the Redfern Natural History website. But can everybody see that? So these are our new page layouts. Very little white matter and just wall-to-wall -wall photos. 
We have over 2,800 different photos. Uh, we feature uh, detailed descriptions of about 500 species and then growing conditions and culture, et cetera, for another 500 or so. Dozens and dozens of in situ pictures. I mean, it's, we thought the first book was great, but this one is just, um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's amazing. So it'll be four volumes. And if you like pictures and if you like miniatures, I'm sure you'll enjoy it, even if, even if you need a forklift to get it into your house. Please. <laughs> I'll stop. Okay, so anybody want to add, please email me because um, I have to keep track of a lot of things. <laughs> so if it's in writing, it helps me. But um, Andrew, I got yours written down. Um, okay. But still, it would be best if you email me too. <laughs> okay. President at Orchid San Francisco or Jay Harris. The, 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 the. Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? Any other questions, yeah. Claire? So, so this is Jennifer Chungafung. So that set of four books is going to be about four hundred dollars, U.S. dollars, if you paid for it. Yeah retail on the the website yes but if we get it through the group about how much you will do you save think? a hundred dollars i think it's gonna I, I can't give you an exact number because a we don't know how much it weighs and b we don't know uh what the exchange rate is going to be on any particular day but um i think it'll be about a hundred dollars per set that you'll be saving Okay, and so if we put in the order, do we have to send the money to at the same time? How how is the payment? I think Jeff is waiting until he gets the ten, and then you're going to place yeah. it. Right. So if you're interested, send me your name, and may, I just need to have names and email address. Then okay. I'll coordinate with Mary when things are ready, and we're sure what we're doing. Then I'll ask you to pay as we're setting it all up. And we'll bulk ship the whole thing probably back to Mary or me or whatever and work out distribution to save you on the shipping cost so we can do it locally, right? Okay. Sounds great. So right now, it's free at this point. All you have to do is tell me if you're interested and then we'll take yeah. it. <laughs> this is Jennifer Chungafung and I'm interested. Okay, got it. I'm in Los Angeles, but I have friends in, in San Francisco who will get it for me. Who pick it up? Actually, once it gets to the U.S., it isn't that expensive to ship. In the U.S., we have what's called media mail, and it's very inexpensive to send. Yeah. Books. The problem is that anything international costs a small fortune. It costs, okay. You know, it it it, it 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 it's it's amazing the difference, but it'd probably be probably less than twenty dollars to mail it from San Francisco to Los Angeles versus probably a hundred dollars or more from um, England to, to San Francisco. Okay. So I'm interested. Great, I got your name. Got it, thank you. Okay. Yeah. And then um, for those that missed the, the beginning, the last announcement was that we're doing a members plant sale, June 27th, maybe that's a Sunday. We may also do 26th. I know I, someone told me it's Gay Pride Day Parade in San Francisco, though I doubt there'll be a parade this year. But um, <laughs> in any event, if you're, if I'm, it's about 12 weeks away. So if you're doing divisions and you might want to sell some plants, even at low prices or whatever, you get like, if you haven't done it before, it's a member benefit you get 75% of the sale. We take 25% of the sale. We handle the sales tax. You just need to let me know that you're interested and we'll coordinate with you. So let me know. And then it's gonna be held um, in the parking lot up in Pacifica at Shell Dance Nursery um, where we did it in October. And uh, more details to come, but we just heard from uh, Nancy Davis yesterday that were confirmed. And she didn't charge us anything to do it, so we can afford to do this. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other announcements, questions before I close the meeting? Good meeting, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. See you all. Bye.